Tutankhamun, treasured antiquity sealed in a tomb. Now weave us a tapestry, silver and gold. Sing us a song of him, centuries old. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Grandmother's patchwork quilt and that old rocking chair up in the attic. We think of them as antiques. But what then shall we call the fabled treasure of King Tut, of Tutankhamun? To us, a century, a hundred years, seems quite a span of time, quite a sizable piece of history. But in Egypt's history, time is not counted in hundreds, but in thousands. And when this boy, who was a king and a god, died at 19, 3,000 years ago and more, his world was already almost unthinkably old. From the National Gallery in Washington, our television cameras will attempt in some measure to shorten the distance between his world and ours, to close in on some of the minute detail of that extraordinary culture which blossomed out of the desert so mysteriously so long ago and with such staggering beauty. Remarkable photo murals, such as the one behind me, early photographs of discovery taken in 1922 will, I guess, on occasion, jolt us back to the reality of the 20th century. The land is Egypt, and a pharaoh with a crook and flail and the scepter of mighty power ruled those ancient cities along the Nile and played a game called Senate and cried, perhaps, in a darkened palace room, wondering if he really was both king and god at eight or nine years old. His name was Tutankhamun, King Tut. He was buried here in the Valley of the Kings, and the world would have forgotten him if it hadn't been for the astounding treasure found in his burial chamber. The murals that exhibit these early black and white photos were made at the time of the discovery. The archeologist who in 1922 made this monumental find was Howard Carter an Englishman who'd been searching for such a tomb for more than six years. Here's Lord Carnarvon, another member of the cast, an English peer who devoted the last years of his life to the project, and Harry Burton, who made hundreds of photographs of the precise moment of discovery with equipment we now look upon as very primitive. This is the site of the tomb. Carter was to save it later, I must have trenched only yards from this spot at least twice over the past six years. Rubble covered the entire area, obliterating any sign of the sepulcher for centuries. Then early one morning in November, digging in this ancient city of Thebes, workmen came across a stone step leading down, and Carter knew he had a find. The dig began in earnest. Sixteen steps led down to a sealed entrance. Patiently, carefully, rock by rock, the passageway was cleared and the tomb opened. Can you see anything? whispered Carnarvon. Yes, Carter replied. Wonderful things. And out of the nightshades of millennia came some 5,000 objects of the young pharaoh's reign. What is it about young boys that's so disarming? They look at you with eyes that ask no questions, reveal no guile. They deal in simple truths, the eyes of boys. And this is the one with the funny name. 3,000 years ago, he was a king, and they called him King Tutankhamun. 
And we call him King Tut because his name is so impossible for us to pronounce. I've known him, this rather special boy, since my own childhood. And you know, for me, the cracked facade of that gentle face and the stylized head in no way impairs his royal grace and bearing. The base of the statue is in the form of a blue lotus that symbolizes an Egyptian view of original creation. The boy is shown as the infant sun god emerging from the lotus, floating on the waters of chaos. It was carved out of some ancient wood, and over this there was a thin layer of plaster, and then it was painted. The result is a most revealing and realistic portrait. Her pierced lobes, her earrings, full sensitive lips, big luminous eyes. As Shakespeare said of another Egyptian monarch, age cannot wither her, nor custom change her infinite variety. You'll notice a large separation in the wood running down the length of the head, shrinkage from drying. Tutankhamun was a relatively unimportant ruler, and the facts about him are very scant. When he came to power some 3,000 years ago, he was eight or nine, and his life was very short. There's a good deal of speculation and mystery about his death, but all we really know is that he was 18 or 19 when it happened. His tomb was modest in size, but richly furnished, laden with varied articles and ornamented with a panoply of royal life. And because of this array of artistic splendor, Egyptologists are able to color in, so to speak, the sketchwork of earlier discoveries. This is a window opening on the substance and quality of ancient Egyptian life. Again, the discovery date, November 1922. This is the condition in which he found the materials in the first antechamber. A certain amount of confusion, he writes, but orderly confusion. Funeral wreaths, 3,000 years old, jars and inlaid boxes with brilliantly colored designs. It took Carter 10 years to restore and record all of the items. And in these oblong containers, roast duck, the young pharaoh's favorite for the long journey into the other world. Now, the treasure. You're going to be able to see the detailed work, often microscopic views, with far greater definition there in your living room than you would at a museum. What do these hieroglyphs say? Listen to a poet of ancient Thebes. May your car, your spirit, live. And may you spend millions of years, you who love Thebes, sitting with your face to the north wind, your two eyes beholding happiness. The young king's drinking cup, 1,300 years before the birth of Christ, carved out of a single piece of white alabaster. This chair, which we'll show you in careful detail, it's made of wood, it's typical of its period. Well, there's no inscription of any kind on it, but since it was left in the tomb, there doesn't seem to be any doubt that it belonged to Tutankhamun when he was a little boy. It stands about as high as a first grader's desk. The wood is ebony, which the Egyptians imported from Nubia. It's inlaid with ivory. And you'll notice the little chair is encased in a glass display area. These are all the priceless treasures in the gallery where humidity can be controlled. The chair was placed in the tomb for the pharaoh's afterlife. And let me explain here that the Egyptian concept of a tomb is a place in which to live again in a serenity and joy unknown on earth. Death was not the end, but another beginning. A tiny sculpture in solid gold. For the first time, we see the body of the little boy 
one recognizes in the exquisite chaste metal the vulnerability of a child, a very young child, already crowned pharaoh of Egypt. This small alabaster chest contained an extraordinary and yet a very human remembrance. Two balls of hair wrapped in linen, some say a wedding contract. The pharaoh was not over nine years old. To secure the throne, they married him at this age to a princess. Her name was Anke Senamen, the daughter of the beautiful Egyptian queen, Nefertiti. Here, forming the lid to a very elaborate box, is Tutankhamun's cartouche. A cartouche is an oval ring on which a king's name and other royal identifications are embossed. An oval nameplate. The bird and two half circles mean tut, reading to the left the cross and circle mean ankh, and the upper symbols amen. The name has a meaning, as did all Egyptian names. Amen is the name of Egypt's protective god. Tut ankh amen means living image of amen. And within that cartouche shaped box, Carter found some dazzling jewelry belonging to the young prince of noble blood. Earrings, here they are highly magnified. Can you make out the design of the mythical bird? There's the wings of a falcon fanned up to make a circle at the top, enclosing the head of a duck. It's made out of clear blue glass. You're looking at one of the rare surviving examples of the earliest man-made clear glass in all of history. And this glass was highly prized by the Egyptians for its luster and ornamentation, but following the decline of the young king's dynasty, the art of glass making was lost for a thousand years. The Greeks and Romans had to invent it all over again. an ominous sign, a curse on a tomb in Thebes. It reads as follows. As for anyone who trespasses on my abode, I shall drag out my corpse. The sun god shall loathe him, and his soul shall be destroyed forever. Now we'll speak of this curse and the treasure and the flowering of ancient Egypt before the clock chimes and the cobra makes further progress through your living room. The pressure on Howard Carter is intense. What other doorways in this tomb? What new treasure to be found? But Carter was a disciplined scientist. All objects were to be marked, wrapped, removed. And among the most venerable and recognized now as a masterpiece of design and craftsmanship is this, the throne of Egypt, wherein doth sit the majesty of kings. More than likely, Tutankhamun was crowned in this elegant ceremonial chair in some vast and airy temple of Thebes over 1,300 years before Christianity began. Egypt was a great power, gold and tribute, poured in from the vassal states, filling the coffers, and the pharaoh's rule was absolute. Well, imagine now a very small and frightened boy, new to this throne. Perhaps he carries a little gold staff as he turns to sit down, and now he squirms on the seat, nine years of age, surrounded by royal favorites, bodyguards, slaves, viziers, adoring subjects prostrate before him. Each sign, hieroglyph, and object in this chair is a work of art. Among the legends on it are a hope for a long life. May the good God live, it says, son of Amen, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, beloved Tutankhamen, ruler. But destiny ruled otherwise. No long life for this ruler. In 10 years, he would die. God at nine, 
and a childhood already dissolving in the morning mist along the Nile. And one wonders, did his feet touch the floor? A golden shrine on a sled of silver, a sanctuary, a protection in the long journey after death. The entire surface is covered with scenes of royal life, all of it in gold relief. This small shrine stands only a little more than a foot high. Inside are the imprint of tiny feet. Carter presumed that a solid gold statuette of Tutankhamen stood here, stolen by those ancient robbers who pillaged the tomb. And on the walls and doors, a royal tapestry in gold, palace life, 3,000 years ago. scepter of the king. It is made of sheet gold beaten on a wooden core. The shaft is in the form of a papyrus flower, all of it embellished with cloisonne work, carnelian, turquoise, lapis lazuli, felspar, and glass. And the message under the frieze, a continuing faith in a life everlasting, living forever, beloved son of Amen. This is the head of a golden fan used by royal court attendants in processions and religious ceremonies. Here we see the young pharaoh in his chariot on an ostrich hunt. This is one of the really outstanding pieces in the collection, a dagger made of hardened gold and its highly decorated and ornate sheath embossed in high relief. We see here an ibex attacked by a lion, a calf with a hound biting its tail, a leopard and a lion. Such golden daggers were reserved for royalty. And this one was found among the folds of the linen wrappings on Tutankhamun's mummy. The shaft is decorated with minute particles of gold and cloison a work of semi-precious stones. Here's a trumpet. It's often used by armies on the march to set the cadence. Herodotus, the Greek historian who traveled the Nile, spoke of such trumpets. He said they sounded like the braying of an ass. A golden buckle with the king represented as a warrior on his chariot returning from battle, a 10-year-old warrior. And so he was crowned, and they said of him in the marketplace, O glorious pharaoh, crops will flourish and cities rise. Did Tutankhamun smile at this because it was the royal custom, and did the supreme vizier tell him, finish your supper, Tutankhamun? Nothing, nothing stirs the imagination quite like the jewelry of antiquity and the Egyptians towered over all the other ancients in craftsmanship. They did splendid work, diverse in color and form, amulets, rings, collars, heavy gold, surpassing the Scythians, the Sumerians, and the Greeks, a cascade of jewel finery for 3,000 uninterrupted years. Put yourself in Carter's shoes for a moment as he opens these treasure chests for the first time. A slight tremble in the hand, perspiration on the palm. Not only from the point of view of quantity is the find amazing, Carter reports to the press, 
the period to which the tomb belongs is the most interesting in the long history of Egyptian art. We are prepared for beautiful things. Carter's words again. Within a yard of one of the rooms off the burial chamber stood what appeared to be a solid wall of gold. An astounding sight. Entombed in darkness for 3,000 years, now coming out of the void for the first time, four freestanding goddesses of the dead. Gracious figures with arms outstretched. So beautiful, writes Carter, so compassionate. And this speaker admits that he's hopelessly in love with one of them. Her name is Selket, a most royal guest of the National Gallery. Behold, she is like a star goddess arising at the beginning of a happy year, of sheen surpassing of radiant skin, lovely of eyes wherewith to gaze, sweeter her lips wherewith to speak. She hath captured my heart in her embrace. She maketh the necks of all men to be turned away, dazzled at the sight of her. A love poem of the 18th dynasty. It was the empire period, and the young boy on the throne. New styles, new freedoms, naturalism in art, manners, and dress. The word gaudy might even apply. Love and laughter along the green banks of the Nile. Historians call it new empire. Wigs worn by both men and women, falling over shoulders in cascades of curls and plaits and braids. Combs, hairpins, scented unguents and lotions, bronze mirrors, depilatories. Vanity, thy name is both man and woman. And a frail and gentle pharaoh was their god. Here now, a treasure of jewelry from the tomb, a flexible gold collar for the king. Just look at the detail, 250 pieces strung together through tiny gold loops. The feathers are made of glass in imitation of turquoise, jasper, and lapis lazuli. In each of the talons, the bird grasps the hieroglyphic sign for eternity, which is inlaid with red and blue glass. Remember that glass was a very treasured article in ancient Egypt, and on a par with semi-precious stones. The entire work is in the form of the vulture goddess Nekbet. Such necklaces were placed on Egyptian mummies, not as mere objects of adornment, but to provide magical protection throughout the long journey into the other world. A pectoral with solar and lunar emblems of magical powers. Isn't it absolutely gorgeous? The eye was a very potent amulet in Egypt. It symbolized the god Horus and protected you against sickness. It means healthy and sound. If you have a dollar bill in your pocket, you'll find the eye of Horus on the dollar. Presumably that means the dollar bill is sound. The scarab in the piece represents the sun god, as does a falcon, which you now see zooming up at you. The sun god was the primary deity among many, many gods. In its talons, the falcon holds the signs for life and eternity, which Incidentally, you see reproduced in modern jewelry today. Both men and women of the Empire period wore jewelry, bracelets, anklets, spectrals, broad collars. The men wore just as much jewelry as the women did. It was a protection against misfortune and above all against being destroyed by death. And the jewelry was protective equipment. Surrounded by the gods, you simply eased into that other world on something akin to Cleopatra's barge of gold in an endless sea of euphoria.
Shall we go into the boudoir of one of those beautiful and vain Egyptians? This is the case for a hand mirror. It's in the shape of an ankh, which remembers the word for life. But this ubiquitous word also means mirror. It's an early play on words, for after all, a mirror does reflect life. Before an Egyptian appeared for the day, hours were spent on making up. The better homes had shallow baths. Water was cascaded down from pitchers. Because the sun was always up there, perfumed oils were rubbed into the skin, and great care was given to the eye, often a black eyeliner around it to cut down reflection from the sun. Eyes heavily lined had religious significance as well. Some 50 of these were found in the tomb. It's a base for perfumed unguents, and when Carter found them, most had been emptied by the ancient robbers the perfume contents being more valuable than the vase itself. The king and queen's cartouche. This alabaster lion is also an unguent jar. The left paw rests on the hieroglyphic symbol for protection. He's beautifully sculptured. This particular jar still held its original contents. And they were pine-scented. A pine aftershave for a young king. That uh, protruding tongue is symbolic, not what you think it means at all. Animals with tongues out reflect gaiety and laughter and joy of living. And very likely, a little boy's sense of humor. history, jars and vessels in the shape of animals were quite common, but they seem to have gone out of style until the 18th dynasty. This ibex is another unguent jar. It's carved of alabaster, but the horns, only one of which was found, are real animal horns. The body was hollowed out to hold the scented unguents. These two vessels, the lion and the ibex, seem to reflect the time, a new freedom in the land of Egypt. Joie de vivre. You see it in the artwork, in the friezes, the sculpture, a blooming, overpowering lust for life. Clothing of Egyptians was always sparse. The mean summer temperature in the Nile Valley remains a constant 100 plus today. Silk and cotton were unknown. The men wore long skirts. Linen was the fabric, and this is the pattern of today's sandal. 4,000 years of foot comfort. In general, dress was comfortable, but the tendency in the new kingdom of this 18th dynasty was toward the elaboration of flowing lines of garments. For example, the gown of Selkut with its folds and pleats of diaphanous linen. Well, you ladies realize, of course, that the discovery of the statue by Carter and the press coverage that it got in the 20s changed the style of women's nightgowns for 30 years. One wonders if the sculptor of this ancient masterpiece was influenced by the features and form of the young king's wife, Anke Senama. This is a 
one of the most fabulous beauties in all history, the legendary Queen Nefertiti. Now, this, of course, is a portraiture not found in Tutankhamun's tomb, but it's been reproduced by the thousands, and she may be on the desk in your study. Actually, we don't know too much about her, except that she lived in Thebes, probably, and that she was the mother-in-law of the young King Tut, and the mother of Anke Senamen. Anke Senamen, a royal name. And she rose to a majesty beyond her years when the young pharaoh died, as we'll discover when a fragment of the puzzle drops into place. Her adoring hands touch his so intimately that each must know most hidden thoughts. They were young, sensual, glowing with a golden affection. This is a love poem from Anka Senamen, written to the young pharaoh. I am unto thee like the acre which I have planted with flowers and all manner of sweet-smelling herbs. And in the acre is a pool. In the cool of the north wind it is a lovely place where I walk. Thine hand upon mine and my body satisfied and my heart glad that are going together it is intoxicating to hear thy voice and my life depends upon hearing thee whenever i see thee it is better to me than food and drink Most people working on excavations confess to a feeling almost of embarrassment when they break into a chamber sealed by pious hands so many centuries ago. You see a finger mark on the leg of a folding stool and it looks as if it were put there yesterday. But you know that yesterday was 3,000 years ago and time is annihilated by this intimate detail. And suddenly you know you're an intruder. Well, both artistically and technically, this wooden chest is one of the most important works of art found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. We'll bring it in very close so you can see the finely textured, painted ivory panels. Quite apart from the art, which reflects the preceding period in Egyptian history, is the theme of this painting. Kings and queens are usually shown as partners in some sort of activity, but here, Ankes and Amun is almost subservient. It's a very personal view of their life together. Another insight perhaps into the affection they had for one another. She's handing him fruit and a bouquet of flowers. Note her bearing, erect, queenly, yet graceful and mobile. Coiffion, Anke Senamen, was a recent innovation, a very long lock of hair worn over the left side and down the body. Some articles from the royal household, an elegant flask made of the finest alabaster. An ivory headrest, an Egyptian pillow, everyone had his own made to order. Shu, the god of air, holds the head above the earth. A vase made of silver, very rare in Egypt. It's a pomegranate, which was quite a novelty along the Nile and introduced from Asia. An oil lamp carved from a single piece of alabaster. Can you see the three cups burning of an evening in some shadowed hallway in the chamber of the royal couple? An unguent jar for the king with a lively lion on its lid. It was believed that if you surround the pharaoh with such symbols of power and majesty and virility, they will become attributes. And what better place to ensure these attributes than on articles of everyday use? An unguent flask was as common as our cold cream jars. And the magic of symbolism is important when your king is a boy. 
are not at all well, some say, ill-suited to the rigors of climate and office. A chest found on the floor of the antechamber is filled with miscellaneous things, knives, baskets, and so forth. Perhaps it was a personal chest of Tutankhamun's. The bands of hieroglyphs are guarantees, promising, among other things, that his eyes and ears will be opened and that heaven will receive his soul. <laughs> retractable handles at the base, and when they're extended, they allow the chest to be moved from room to room in the palace at the king's pleasure. But very soon, the chest will move from palace to tomb. I find this to be one of the most touching yet poignant artifacts to be uncovered by Mr. Carter. And the fact that it's here among the burial materials is further evidence of the nature of this boy. It's a game. Four like this were found in the tomb. Nothing is known for certain about the rules of play. Now, the game is called Senate and seems to resemble the modern game of Parcheesi. All of this ancient woodwork is fascinating. Dovetail joints, 3,000 years old. Inscriptions and glyphs are rather mundane, wishing the king life and prosperity in employing such epithets as beautiful of birth, precious offspring, strong bull, and other such wishful endowments. Exquisite craftsmanship. Looking for all the world like an expensive game in the drawing room of a 20th century tycoon. It's very difficult to believe when you look at it that the game was actually played in palaces and homes 3,000 years ago. You know, there's a lovely Egyptian poem. And again, Anke Senaman comes to mind. It's in story form. This is a fairly literal translation. The words brother and sister are somewhat misleading. In ancient Egypt, lovers were called brothers and sisters. Here it is. My beloved brother, my heart burneth for thy love. I say to thee, behold what I do. I am come to catch birds with my net in my hand and my cage. How I long for thee, that we might go to the marshes together. How good it were if thou shouldst be with me to wait for that singing bird with feathers. How lovely it is to go to the meadow unto him who is beloved. The voice of the lark calleth out, but love of thee holdeth me back. I will lay down my net. Now then, my mother will say, Hast thou caught no bird today? Thy love carried me off. The breath of thy nostrils is that alone which maketh my heart to live. Night shades are closing, tomb shadows move, but the dark is not light enough, and the cause of the young king's death is as mysterious today as the facts surrounding his birth. It, it might have been a natural death. He was a frail child. Was it murder? There's slim evidence of that. An accident? 
Possibly. He wasn't 19 when he died, that's all we know for sure. Well, there was much beating of the chest and sobs of mourning in the valley of the Nile, and the young and childless Ankes and Amun comes to grips with an ominous threat to her crown. There are those who would wrest it from her. We still have her letter addressed to the king of the Hittites. My husband is dead, writes the queen, and I have no son. Do you have a grown-up son? Send me one, and I will make him king of Egypt. But no new king for Anka Sanana. Figures and deities, such as this cobra, were made to help the king through the mysterious and often treacherous underworld. Egyptians believed in a world somewhere to the west. And this new land would be like Egypt in every way. But there were trials along the path, and you had to be able to give correct answers to demons who would ask questions. This is the Pharaoh, now the sun god, passing through the turbid waters of the unknown, bringing a moment of light to all the inhabitants. In this excellent piece of sculpture work, the young king is about to harpoon a hippopotamus, Seth, the god of evil, on that long and arduous journey through the underworld. But the god of evil is not shown as it might be a source of danger to the king of the tomb. This is a Shawapti, an Egyptian alter ego a tiny 12-inch slave that labors for you in the other world. If Osiris commands, cut the wheat fields, a Shawapti does it. I'm quoting now from the Book of the Dead, Shawapti instructions. O thou Shawapti, if thou art commanded to do what must be done of various kinds of work, speak up and say, here I am. And so, preparations are made in the tomb of Tutankhamun for eternal life according to classical rites established at the time of the gods. A series of natural but uncommonly bizarre events took place following the discovery of the tomb. Lord Carnarvon died from a septic insect bite. Two others connected with the team were to succumb. Newspapers began calling it the mummy's curse, labeled preposterous by the scientific expedition. Clearly, the work of Anubis echoes the Basque, the golden phoenix. Anubis, the jackal god of embalming, is represented here in a most eerie emblem made of gilded wood. It depicts a headless animal skin attached to a pole in an alabaster base. Now, the magic of Anubis was powerful, essential for mummification, a religious rite of great importance to an ancient Egyptian. For without a body, there could be no resurrection. And for eternal life, resurrection was a practical necessity. A pharaoh's mummy was very sacred. To have it destroyed or lost was a disastrous fate. The appointed day approaches. A procession of sacred animal heads, priests symbolizing gods, mourners and coffins, winds its way on a long journey from the palace to the Valley of the Kings. This stopper, it's about the size of your hand, is a lid to one of four jars, an exquisite portraiture of Tutankhamun at the time of his death, a beautifully carved likeness in alabaster. Miraculously, in those 70 days of mourning, craftsmen turn out such splendid works of art as this, lids to the beautiful canopic jars. Such jars contain mummified internal organs of the pharaoh. They are sealed and placed in the tomb. A man has perished and his corpse has become dust. All his kindred have crumbled to dust. But writings cause him to be remembered in the mouth of the reciter. 
this and the small miniature coffin of gold which we show you next were very sacred vessels. The mummified contents have long since decomposed. He was Pharaoh, God to his people, slain or dead of natural causes before the zenith of his boyhood, mourned by a multitude of grateful subjects who lavishly stuccoed his burial chamber with gold. Yet he moves unnoticed obscure throughout the recorded years of antiquity until a step is uncovered by an inquisitive scholar searching for the jagged fragments of a puzzle. Have we disturbed your rest, young man? Has the careful examination of your ancient bones deflected a voyage of some 3,000 years? Is the car still moving on that tranquil sea? Or was it all so planned by Isis and Osiris millennia ago that a boy would show us his picture book with his colored glass and alabaster? The 20th century looks back in wonder. We may be for all our posturing, but a passing footnote in the documents of civilized man. National Gallery in Washington, touring Chicago, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Seattle, and finally, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. We hope you've enjoyed this hour of introspection, the dazzling beauty of ancient Egypt, the richest archaeological find known to man. A final moment of contemplation an early Egyptian grace note in the distant music of the Nile. God be between you and harm in all the empty places you must walk. Good night. This show is recommended by the National Education Association.